Hey guys, here we are. A very special guest today. I'm here with Johnny Morgan from Johnny Morgan's Synth Dreams channel from YouTube. Hey Johnny, how you doing? Good, good. Yeah, thanks for coming over. Yeah, it's great to see you guys. Yeah, totally. Appreciate it. Um, so we're here. I would love to learn a bit more about your studio today, about your YouTube channel, also your history. Uh, you've been involved in video games for 20 plus years in audio production and soundtracks. Um, and everything else. I know you've done also some live music, yep. um, but um, there's so much to talk about and I'd love to just learn a bit more about you and also your studio and your synths. Yeah. So let's start there. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So here we are. Um, we're in your studio. Uh, maybe you can take us around, tell us a bit about what the history of this place and how it all came together. Yeah. So um, the studio is was actually just to be honest it's basically half of uh, a room that I have at my place and I I uh, kind of just put all my synths in here during COVID because I had to uh, vacate a, another studio I had downtown so uh, at the moment it's just mostly just a room full of synths and uh, yeah I, I uh, hope to one day uh, build it out a little better make it into a sort of a proper studio mm -hmm. but um, at the moment it's just kind of a workspace right now so what you see is kind of my my like workspace uh, that I work on, you know, doing music here and some video game editing mm -hmm. uh, during the day. So, yeah. Awesome. That's kind of what it is, yeah. So, um, so what's in the studio? What do we have here today? You've got, obviously, a lot of yeah. different gear. Yeah, well, come on in. Um, yeah, we can start with this, um, this uh, synth wall here, which is great. I've got these, uh, these Jasper stands, which are awesome, by the way. If you ever need a really big synth stand, these guys uh, in... Um, I think they're in Denmark, uh, make these, these Jasper stands and I ordered one so I could fit some of the stuff on here. Mm -hmm. Um, and the first, uh, the first one is a sampler actually, the S50. Okay. And actually the S50 is, uh, was, um, kind of like one of the first samplers Roland made. And act I actually, when I was a kid, I really wanted this sampler badly. <laughs> so, but it was really expensive. And it's kind of, to be honest, sort of like a poor man's Fairlight. Like it actually does a lot of um, really cool stuff. Like you can, you can actually um, hook up a little monitor. So I've got, oh, yeah. I've got a video card um, put in there. Yeah, it's neat. So when you play, you can see what's going on. You can scroll through like all the, all the system software on that. Actually. Nice. Yeah, it's really neat. And uh, yeah, I like the S50. Like it actually, to be honest, sounds like it cuts through the mix as a 12-bit sampler, so it kind of has its sound. But um, just as like aesthetically, I think it's an awesome keyboard too. Yeah. Like it just looks really cool. So very minimalist. It is minimalist. Yeah, it's kind of that 80s minimalist vibe. And uh, yeah, so but I, I find actually like to be honest, like the sound libraries that came with Roland are, are awesome. So I. I, uh, I just mostly stick to those and load up some strings or something like that, some oohs and ahs. I could actually uh, see, you know, it's got, it's got, it's got that good 12-bit sound. It's really nice. Nice. Uh, um, cool. Yeah, the next uh, one is actually, um, let's go to the JX-10. Oops, sorry. <laughs> JX-10 actually right now is my master controller, so it's kind of set up to play everything. And um, yeah, the JX-10 is really cool. Like it... It's two GX8Ps, but a little different as well. Like you can stack things up and it, you know, some people say it doesn't sound quite as good as a GX8P, but you know, it's, it's a pretty, pretty beefy synth. Like I, to be honest, it's hard to get it into a mix because it does sound so fast sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, it's 12 voices, right? Yeah. And um, it is actually two, if you open it up, it actually is two JX AP boards like stacked together. That's right. So it literally is like two JX APs, but it, there are some differences. So, hmm. and then I actually have the um, the DT Tronics controller for it, which isn't the Beethoven version because they have better ones that actually do all the Beethoven mods. But um, but um, yeah, so this you know it's just like basic controller. I, I yeah. could ever find a good PG eight hundred for sale. They're so. pretty hard to find. Yeah, and they're so, pretty expensive. Yeah, so I just was like, you know, I'll just get this for the time <laughs> being, and yeah, it does it does the trick. It's pretty cool. So. Sweet. Yeah, it's gonna be amazing. And so all the buttons are fully functional. Or yeah, yeah, issues? yeah. It's totally yeah. It's yeah. it's great. It's in really good shape. And actually, um, yeah, I kind of use this my master keyboard to be honest. Just to, like like I come over here and play it. And so I've got the mm. way the studio's set up is that this. This synth can control like like anything in the studio. Okay. Which is neat. Um, I don't know. We can come over here later, but 
this eye connectivity um, interface is like is amazing actually because you can you can set it to like um, you know be like the the GX10 can be the master control for the whole studio. So right, that's right. The way it's set up right now. So so yeah. before we dive into the rest yeah. of it, like yeah. um, maybe you can tell us a bit about your history. Like how did you even come to this place? Like how, where yeah. did this all start from? Um, yeah, uh, actually, yeah. To be honest, like. Wow. Okay, you go back. Let's go um, way back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, I originally got into keyboards in the '80s. I I was really into like synth pop, like Howard. To be honest, like Howard Jones. I was like the only kid in my school that liked Howard Jones, like because everyone was into metal and like mm. Iron Maiden and stuff. And um, I was like the kid that liked like synth pop, like Depeche Mode and Howard Jones and stuff. And I was liked like the keyboard work that Howard Jones did. So he really inspired me to. Like, get into synth so um yeah so my first synth was a uh, was actually an s10 sampler mm -hmm. so the little guy this i actually went to uh, a studio in victoria bc uh, sorry uh, ward music in victoria bc and bought that and uh then uh i collected a few other synths like a jx3p and did um did like synth pop with my friend with a little like roland sequencer mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing led to another. I got into industrial music and then um, into, like, in the in the late 80s, I got into, like, bands, playing in bands and, like, you know, keyboards, big hair. Right, right. That sort of thing. <laughs> um, yeah, and, uh, yeah, I didn't escape that scene. So I have some <laughs> photos of, of that. And then I actually quickly got into, like, in the early 90s, I got into, um, like, minimal techno. And that was like when guys like Richie Houghton and some things like that were just starting to happen. And so we were like, wow, we should just scour the pawn shops for 909s and 808s and that sort of thing. So I got into that scene, which kind of led me into house music and like different types of styles like that. So I was kind of like one foot in the door of metal bands, but one foot in the door of house music and synth collecting. So I actually bought like Lots of synths in the nineties bought and sold like mini moves and like, mm. you know, different, you know, emulators and things like that. And, you know, I haven't kept a lot of it, but, um, but I still have like, you know, I still have like this 808 that I found. Oh, wow. At a, this 808 I found at a flea market for like a couple hundred bucks. Wow. And then, um, when was that? Uh, that was in like 95 maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. When everybody was getting rid of analog. Yeah, yeah, you know, they were still around. Like you could you had to you had to go like a weekend for us would be like, let's go pawn shopping. And we just go to like all the pawn shops and and auctions and mm. uh, see what was out there. Yeah. So, so, so speaking of that, yeah. You end up with somehow with a Jupiter eight at some point. Yeah, this Jupiter eight actually in similarly, um I got and it sounds awesome. It's actually let me just uh dial up a cool sound here. Yeah. Um um, this Jupiter 8 was, um, you know, it's really crazy. Actually, there's a mailing group called Analog Heaven that was around sort of pre, um, pre eBay, pre like all that stuff. And someone posted it in Analog Heaven, like Seattle, Jupiter 8 for sale. And I was like, right away, I called, they had a phone number. I called, I'm, I'm coming. Like I just literally, I'll be there in like hours. Yeah. And, uh. So I drove down there and bought it off this old lady who had it sitting in her garage. Oh. And um, yeah, so as as it turns out, it's it, it was um, I believe was um, was the the mom of Greg Rowley from Jute from from Journey. Whoa! So, I don't know. I can't be sure about that. A, but, and Santana, right? Yeah. So I think this was one of their old old synths. Wow. Yeah. So that's kind of the story behind this. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. And I, I literally, um, recently had it, um, recapped. So it's sounding like awesome right now. Like, like new again. Yeah. Yeah. Literally like, um, yeah, it kind of had a few funky things. Like there was a 662, um, BCA that was gone on it. So mm -hmm. we had to get a few things fixed, but now it's okay. sounding awesome. So. Awesome. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's great. It's awesome. Yeah. It actually, it's, I've been using it more and more in music because it, it just kind of always sounds a little bit like, a little bit like, like wonky. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that to me is like, yeah, it's a really good sound. Like it's not like a perfect. 
Right. So, you know, you can really hear it when you play it like it it sounds like analog stuff going on in there. Like it doesn't sound like, you know, like I know in the sequential stuff, they have the, like the rev one, two and three button. This thing sounds like a rev one like all the time. <laughs> like, you know, like, you know, yeah, it's super uh, organic. Yeah. And this the, is, the VCOs this is one of the earlier JP eight. So it's not like, the um, it's, it's got like, it's not the DCB version. So it's, it's 12 bit then yeah, it's 12 bit. Yeah, yeah. So it's got like, it's got a bit of a wonky sound to it. Nice man. Yeah. It's cool. So like, do you usually keep the studio sort of as is or do you change stuff out a lot? Um, um, yeah. Like I sometimes I borrow or trade sense with friends um, to just try something new out, you yeah. know, like um, had a PPG in here for a while, you know, which was a lot of fun. Okay. Yeah. So we'll swap out. Like I'll actually loan, like I'll go borrow my Jupiter 8 and I'll try a PPG or something like that. Yeah. Right. I've, I've done that, but nice. yeah, swapping things out here and there. Yeah. Cool, yeah. man. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. like, what do you usually typically produce in the studio? Are you using um, a lot of this for your own work or yeah. more for, um, you know, work with the company? Yeah, so my video game stuff, I don't use the synths a whole lot now because mostly just sound design. Mm-hmm. Um, but I work with composers in, in games to, like, help them compose music. So I, I don't compose a lot of music myself anymore. Um, back in my old days at EA, we did when I started there, we, it was, there was about seven or eight composers, uh, Rom DePrisco, good friend of mine and Ken Marshall and Traz mm. Damji. And there's a whole list of them, Crispin Hands mm. that wrote like music for need for speed and FIFA. And, uh, and, uh, we did it all in house. Like it was all like custom written music for, for our games. So, right. um, now, um, you know, we just, we just get composers to work on projects. So I don't work on a lot of music for games, mostly just like managing the projects. And got it. Got sort it. Of thing. So, so, yeah. So you're, let's just quick, quick credential yeah. list. Yeah. I mean, you've worked for EA. Yeah. Uh, what, what did you, which games did you work uh, on for yeah, audio? Like the big one I worked on was this game called SSX Tricky, which is a, uh, like a snowboarding game. Actually. Uh-huh. Yeah. I've got like the DVD over there, the original, like they gave oh, yeah. this to the production team, which are awesome. Yeah. Wow. And yeah, those are cool. And um, yeah, Tricky was the big one. And then uh, I worked on some like FIFA um, snowboarding games, FIFA soccer mm. and uh, that sort of thing. So yeah, yeah. And I also see up here there's um, yeah. Power Plant Music with yeah, a nice record. Yeah, that was my house music label back in the like, 90s and 2000s. Right. Yeah. So we, we made vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> that was before CDJs uh, took over. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah it's great. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, and then over here, I oh, can yeah. see some more stuff going on. Yeah, that was like a bedrock compita- compilation I was on. And here's the D- here's I was in a um, the gaming magazine. They featured like my music and gave everybody a free CD. So that was pretty cool. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of neat. Yeah, dude, this is like so much history here. <laughs> yeah, I got a couple <laughs> of little things left over from from games. <laughs> Yeah, and but, so now I work for Microsoft, so that's kind of uh, my my thing these days. Awesome. That's good. Yeah. Well, uh, there's obviously a lot in here, yeah. so the Jupiter 8, of course, is probably yeah. the king. Yeah, totally. But, yeah, um, it's great. I see you. Awesome. Yeah, you also have a DX9. Yeah, this is a DX9 that I fixed up, and I bought it for um, super cheap, actually. Oh, that was sounding really crazy. Um, yeah, and it, it actually... Uh, it's um it's neat. It really cuts through. Um, mm. It's got old DX sound, but I was gonna say I, it reminds me of this game I used to play when I was a kid called Marble Madness. And every time I hear it, I just think of of, of those like those sounds from that game. Right. Because uh, I think they had the same. It had like a DX FM chip in it in the in the game, like the actual physical console. So right. It sounded really cool. So amazing. Yeah. So I keep it just for that. Actually, to be honest, I, it's like. I like that, like, lo-fi DX sort of sound, early DX sounds. So, yeah. Yeah, this is, it's great. It's very simple. It's a bit more gritty than the, uh, I guess, DX7-2 yeah. onwards. Yeah, exactly. Because um, yeah. then, then it became 16-bit. Yeah, like, I have a TX802, which is basically the DX7-2 um, rack. Right. And it's like, you know, it's like, it sounds awesome. Like, it's a DX, everything you'd want about DX, mm-hmm. you know, you could layer sounds up. It's actually cool because uh, the way it works... Um, it's it's multi timbral so it'll it'll you can actually stack like eight sounds together or two and if you do two it's like four voices each or you can do eight with with two voices like it's you know or i think how it works um so it 
it scales the voices depending on how many things you have stacked on top of each other. It's right. Really cool. Yeah. So you can actually get pretty big sounds as long as you're not playing too many notes. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's kind of neat. And what's this above it here? We got the little uh, oh. ARP mini here? or Yeah, this is actually the ARP um, 2600. Um, yeah, the, the reissue that just came out. Right. And I've always wanted a 2600, so I figured it was like... You know, it's time. It was time. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, the cool thing about this thing is that it's kind of a real sound designer's workbench. Like, more than anything, I find that you could kind of just do anything with it. And um, so, mm. if you're into sound design, this thing's awesome. Like, just as a tool for making sounds and weird. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's weird. It's like, it sort of cuts through slightly sometimes. If you got. Yeah, the sort of oscillator joining on there a yeah, little bit. Yeah. yeah. That's all right. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the MS One. Actually, I have the MS. This MS One was a uh, was. Um, I used to have an SH One Hundred and One, and when Behringer releases, I I was you know they're cheap, and you know it's got an actual real Curtis thirty three forty in it, or I guess a thirty three forty clone. Mm. But it 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 has that like low bass sound that I like, right? Which is really nice. You yeah. know, it's like super super warm I, I put a bit of glide on it so it's great for like some nice bass lines yeah for bass lines i actually that's all i use it for for sure yeah it's great oh it's yeah. wicked yeah it's great for bass lines and sort of thing yeah cool cool and then, uh yeah what's uh we got in the corner here oh, some yeah, yeah. uh sneak in here um, dramatics is, or yeah so this is my little oh, like tv 303 um <laughs> section so yeah this is like an old TB303 I found back in like the 80s. I've, I've owned a few and this one, this one I just is the one I kept because it was so crappy. I didn't really think anyone would want to buy it <laughs> looking. Yeah. But a typical of any good 303 of that age, it looks, it's really worn. Like I've, I've used the crap out of it. Um, yeah, see, yeah, like you can, you know. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, and I picked up a Behringer um, TD3 just to go with it because I always thought, you know, uh, I always like the sound of like two 303s going at once, like the hard floor sort of things. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's neat. Yeah, nice. and actually, and the 606 I've had forever, and yeah, it's great. It's kind of like a mini 808. Like I love the hi hats and a lot of things about the 606. It's just super sort of simple right yeah 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 you uh, it's sort of like the acid house thing yeah yeah like this is if i want to just kind of come over here and do some like some sort of like you know acid stuff or just simple like you know you know techno type stuff yeah right that's good yeah cool cool yeah it's kind of neat and that's all like i can sync that up to my my computer so i can i can switch this over to like you know to midi and then it's like my computer drives the whole thing too so i can track it and yeah. yeah. Uh, I also noticed the uh, ESQ1 down yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, let's check it out. Yeah. So, what's the story behind this one? Yeah, the ESQ1, um, you know, like, uh, I'm a D50 guy. Like, I bought a D50 back in, like, the 80s. And, um, you know, the ESQ1 was kind of like one of the competitors. So, I, I never owned one back then, but I always, uh, like, my friends always had them. Uh, Skinny Puppy was really into them, and um, you know, back in the you know mid and early '90s, um, they were sort of around the scene with some friends of mine, and you know, I always saw these ESQ ones, and so I think it was in the mid 2000s I picked one up because they were so cheap. Like you can buy these things for like 500 bucks, and they're um, you know they're like they're kind of like a hybrid um digital synth that just has a lot of features and i love the layout like the actual way it's you know presented the screen and everything about it so basically yeah it's a digital synth but it's got a lot of um you know to be honest like people that own them just sort of swear by them they're kind of a i would say like a jack of all trades synth like it sounds it's digital but it sounds good and it has a lot of a lot of like you know there's a lot of a lot of options with it. Yeah, it's got a nice crunch yeah, to the tone because nice of the hybrid. Yeah. yeah, and it's in Sonic's first synth, I think. So that's right. So it uses like their early, early um, sound chip in it and stuff like that. So it's cool. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Cool, man. And then you also have the uh, <laughs> yeah. the RD9 above here. Yeah, the RD9. Like I used to. Again, I used to own a 909, and I think I sold it off when I thought 
you know, I don't really use it that much. And they were worth a lot of money, mm. which I thought was a lot back then, which is not a lot by what they're worth now. Yeah. Um, but um, so when Behringer came out with the RD9, I was like, wow, for the price, like you can't really, you can't really beat it. Like it's, it sounds like just like a 909. Like it's, yeah. It's, you know, to be honest, like there's, there's almost no difference. No one would really know. And um, it's got a few other little features like this filter on it. That's kind of cool. Oh yeah. You can do. You can like pick which drums you're gonna filter, and then like. Um, and you can automate that too. I yeah, think. yeah. You can record really, the automations. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, it sounds great. Yeah, it's cool. Anyway, yeah, it's cool. It's fun. Awesome. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Um, I also noticed this huge modular setup. Yeah. So I'd love to learn a bit more about this. Yeah. So this is... Um, uh, if you wouldn't mind showing us. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. I actually, to get it to work, I kind of have to mute a few things here on my board because um, my controller... Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. There it is. It is playing. Um, let me just turn it up. There we go. Yeah. Um, so we're hearing the modular here? Yeah, it's the modular playing right now. And, uh, you know, here's the, like, uh, here's a, let's see what we got here. See what we got here. This. So, so what, yeah. what kind of system is this? Oh, yeah. Who, so, who makes yeah, it? This, um, yeah, so this is actually, um, this is a synthesizers.com. Not synth, sorry, not synth, it's synthesis tech. So it's um Paul Schreiber uh -huh. um, from SynthTech, and it was all like it's you know he used to sell kits. So I think in the late '90s I started just buying like kits off them and building them myself, which with a soldering iron you just kind of piece them all together. Mm -hmm. um, do I have? Oh yeah, I have one. Actually, I have a kit that I just built. Actually, the Telon. Neural oh. agonizer. I haven't put it in yet. Holy jeez. Yeah, it's cool. This is what? actually. I've got reverb tanks. I've got to hook up. This is like a <laughs> reverb module. This is awesome. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's um, yeah, it's really cool. So basically, yeah, it's a, uh, it's basically an old, um, you know, he doesn't even make five U anymore. He's all gone to Eurorack. Um, so this is kind of like five U synth stuff, and I've got um, I've got, uh different filters like the CS80 filter, the MS20 filter, and you know, um, this triple resonant filter. So I've got a lot of different filters for it. And you know, but basically it's not like, the thing about this synth is it's actually like, it's actually a synth. Like it's not like, um, you know. How many uh, VCOs you got in here? Um, I've got three VCOs and then a sub oscillator as well. Okay. And so I've got that. this is three VCOs playing right now. Wow, it's pretty. It's pretty big sounding. Like, and it's not again. It's not Euro racky where you're doing all sorts of weird stuff. It's like a synth. Like mm -hmm. it's you know, it's just basically like um, you know. And then this actually, this is really cool. This is the, um, this is like a little um, sequencer. sequencer. Yeah, it's like a if I go. Whoops, that's my MIDI interface. So voltage out. Let me start this thing up. Um, why is it not running? Which is weird. It should be. Huh. Sorry, I'm running right now. Sorry. That's okay. So, yeah, so I've got a little sequence here I can fire up and do some things with it. That's okay. Right. Yeah. So you've been collecting yeah. these modules over yeah. time? Or um, you just sort of get it all at once? Yeah, yeah. I built a lot of them myself. You and built then it. I actually bought a bunch off a local guy that was just kind of getting out of it. Mm -hmm. So he was going into Eurorack and he was like, why don't you just buy some of my modules? So I just kind of pieced it all together into one like super synth yeah yeah oh, and you get this case actually i bought this case off him too yeah He's, this thing's huge yeah yeah it's massive yeah it's cool i i should use it more than i do because like it is actually really powerful but you know like you gotta take the time and get into it and patch it and yeah do you, know, you know yeah you gotta be in the right mindset you face. do like it's <laughs> more of an experimental mindset if you yeah. want something really weird sounding that's it but you gotta be like in the mood for like let's make something weird yeah. Cool. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Well, what else is in this corner? I think that's about it here. But um, oh, yeah. we've got obviously the sort of main setup here. Yeah. We are yeah, doing mixing. Doing this mixer. Yeah, this is great. And then um, let me just unmute everything. So I, I usually like everything live, just so I can play it, and mm -hmm. then I just track whatever I need. This is really cool here. The Lyra Eight. It's kind of fun. Oh, yeah. Um, 
This is this is basically like a drone scent, which is really crazy. Yeah, you can you can, you can get everything going. Do all sorts of weird modulations with it and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's really neat actually. This thing you could just lose hours with this. Totally. Yeah. Super experimental. Yeah, yeah. So many makes so much great gear. Yeah, they're uh -huh. cool. So yeah, I was like, man, I what, you know, seeing people play it online and stuff. I was like, this is right up my alley, and I, I haven't had a lot of time to explore it, but it's really, really awesome. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, yeah, over here is just actually two more synths. So this is um, this is my actually my original D fifty that I bought in nineteen eighty eight. Wow. Yeah. Look at this, it's all um, yeah. metal. Yeah, so what happened was, is I, I was touring a lot and uh, I just asked a friend of mine who was a metal worker just to like, just kind of take a brush sander to it and make it all metal looking just so that like on stage it just looked really cool. And um, yeah, so that's what it is. But it's still, you know, it's still very much a D50 on the inside. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, the D50s, I, I love the D50 because it's, um, to be honest, the synth engine in the D50 is like fantastic. Like it, it's when, still, it, it sounds like an analog synth. To be honest, like at times, right? Yeah. Like if you take out like the PCM sample section and just go with like the analog voices in it, it's actually like it's pretty cool. Yeah. So. Yeah, the uh, linear arith arithmetic yeah, uh, synthesis, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that was the new thing back then. Yeah, they did a good short yeah, transients. You and... know, it's got its own sound, but. I still come back to it all the time. Yeah, it's very um, airy, yeah. the sound, and it's very um, nostalgic. Yeah. Uh, you know, it not. definitely has a distinct tone. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and so the D50, like, when I bought it, it was like, you had to have one. It was like the synth, like, yeah. Yeah. It was awesome. And then the Jupiter 8, this, I'm sorry, Jupiter, Jupiter 6. 6. Um, yeah, this synth, I bought this synth for about $600, which was a lot when I bought it. But, back in the nineties. Back in the nineties, uh, but um, and it's a it's a beast, like to be honest. But it's very different than the eight. Like it's um, the eight is like very warm and fuzzy sounding. This is like hard and like you know very um, you know to be honest, it has a lot in common with um, like I would say like the Synfex. Mm -hmm. it, they're actually pretty similar in a weird way, like because they're very Curtis. ICs of that era, but um, if, if you're doing like that orbital sound, like you know, there's nothing like it. Like it's 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 it really cuts through. So if you make techno, like this thing is awesome. Yeah, sometimes it can sound really plain, and other times it can sound just like totally crazy. Right. Yeah. So it's um, it's actually like to be honest, like it's kind of one of my favorite synths. Like, yeah, it's got some unique features. I think. Um, yeah. It's got the multiple waveform selects. Yeah. Right, yeah. and you can cross modulate both VCOs yes. either direction. Yeah. Uh, where is that function here? Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can actually select both filters at once too, which is really cool. I actually have that on right sweet. now. Sweet. So like so you can actually go high pass, low pass, or like both and do right. like a band pass thing. Yeah, yeah. It's kinda neat. Like yeah, so, so Well cool. they've definitely shot up in price these days, just like everything else, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, it's crazy. Just I, I don't know. To be honest, like it's nuts. Like synflation's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah, so that's kind of the synth stuff. And then Beautiful. Up here I've got a little rack of like samplers. These are actually my old samplers I used to use when I was like touring and stuff and um and because uh, just I could load lots of sounds on them. I used to use zip drives, so I actually load everything live on it on the zip disk because <laughs> like um, that was all we had back then. Um, and then this is the S550 that um, is pretty cool because I've got it. I've got a SCSI to HD hard drive put in it, so I've got like access to all the Roland sound libraries up here. So I can just like scroll through and just load whatever what I want. Oh, yeah. So it's super cool. Like yeah, you can just like load chain, execute. Yeah, just loads away. It's oh, kind of really cool. Yeah, and yeah, to be honest, it's kind of like a, a like a like Roland kind of made it as like a multi tom roll like workstation type vibe to it because it's it could just like 
hold so many sounds and you know you can you can it's kind of wacky what's doing right now but um but yeah anyway the vibe was that you know if you were a composer you could put like a lot of different synths on this thing and you know you'd have access to them all right away so amazing of, but um i don't use it much but it's kind of fun to play around with yeah. yeah so i also noticed over here on the left there's a uh sort of magician's curtain yeah like, <laughs> what's like, behind the curtain just a bunch of to be honest just like you know studios always have like junk and odds and ends and cables and stuff but um whoops uh cable boxes old dj bags oh yeah i've got um this is my mac plus actually from back in the 90s 80s uh -huh. yeah and i actually used to sequence on that but i it's uh you know, I've got an, a MIDI interface somewhere around for it. And uh, occasionally I, I fire it up. My 20 megabyte hard drive on the bottom there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can you believe that or not? That big box is 20 megabytes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's pretty fun. So, yeah. That's, That's crazy. like just some stuff. Just keep it out of the way. But, yeah. You know, studios always have cable. Yeah, bits and bobs, yeah, you know. Yeah, exactly. I wish I had some closet for it all, but I don't. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'd be, there's also quite a spindle there of um, oh, yeah, CDRs. Yeah, or... see, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. It's back in the day when you're burning discs. Are. Literally, these are, um, these are old. If you grab these, these are old. Um, this is uh, like electronic arts. That's like um, slate, that's Slayboarder. So it was a song we did for SSX. Oh, wow. It's like the master disc. Wow. Yeah, like this is all just like old, old stuff like that. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, literally like... Back in the old EA days, I mean, we used to literally, um, like, it was all CDs and burning discs. And, yeah, yeah. yeah it so, wasn't, like, quite like it is where it's all just digital files now. So, so speaking yeah. of the old days, um, yeah. I mean, you can touch maybe high level, but, yeah. like, when you were at EA, yeah. when was that, 2000? Uh, it was 1997 97? to 2007, yeah. Okay, so yeah. what was it like to actually make music back then with the gear? Yeah. Or what like, were you using back yeah, then? Yeah, I had a Cubase for... Um, for an, uh, a PC, and uh, I would do I would do all the song. I actually had all these synths and like a bunch of stuff in my studio, and mm -hmm. and there's actually a magazine Future Music did a a feature on us back then, and they went in my studio. So I sometimes like I had uh, yeah just a lot of gear, and so we'd actually do it all MIDI, mm -hmm. and I would um, I would like bring my all my gear down to the big studio downstairs, which was like a big mixing studio with the euphonics console and um our mix engineer ken marshall who used to mix for skinny puppy and a bunch of bands like that um and he still he has a great youtube channel too called high watt marshall I, actually uh, he does like you know production videos and stuff and ken um would actually mix all our songs so we'd bring it all down and we'd literally like press play on the on the key bass and we track it all in and um, we track it in with onto uh, D88s, okay. which was a, like a digital eight, eight track system. Right. We had about like six of them. So we could do probably like 48 tracks or something. And um, yeah, so we track it all in digital D88 and then we'd mix it just like an old school, like, you know, everything on the console, like mix the band and uh, then we'd master it to a two track digital file and that was it. Okay, so, yeah. nice. So a lot of those songs, I don't even have them anymore because they were all MIDI files and D88 tapes. Right, right. So like, you know, yeah, they don't exist. Yeah. They're, they're on a D88 tape somewhere. Somewhere, somewhere. Yeah, someone's they, studio. They, they, still, still, Behind still, someone's curtain. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hardware-wise, were you guys using soft synths a lot or hardware synths? Yeah, no, or... it was, um, there was no soft synths. So you, this is back when, um, like, computers just weren't powerful enough like the first soft synth that i remember seeing was rebirth mm. when, like the tv303 i was like wow they can recreate a tv303 on a on a computer this is incredible um so we were yeah literally midi files and hardware Got and it. so we had like a few cool um since kicking around the studio like ea would buy us uh, you know, since like Nord Leeds, Nord, you know, whatever we wanted. Yeah. So, like, it, I, I think I got them to buy me uh, Novation Super Nova. Really? Yeah. Which well, was that's nice. Cool. Yeah, it was nice at the time. And uh, someone had a Waldorf Q. Oh, yeah. Uh, which was, we shared around. Awesome. Yeah, was, that's a great scent. Yeah. At that time, it was like a beast. Totally. It like, still is. Yeah. We had yeah. the yellow. Uh, I, I have one myself. You have the yellow Waldorf Q. I do. Nice. Yeah. yeah. 32 voice. Those things are amazing. <laughs> yeah. So um, that was always a hot commodity. Yeah. Like, who has the Waldorf Q? And it'd be like, I think Rom has it. And so I'd be like, can I borrow it this weekend? And 
Um, yeah, and then we all had our own since, like, I had my Jupiters and, um, you know, some other things there at the time. So, you know, right. whatever we, we could use on our own. And, and have, yeah. you, have you found that, obviously, since then, things have changed a lot in terms of um, audio music production in the studios? Yeah. With the I games mean, and most stuff? Most people don't use hardware much. Like, they're mostly just all in the box. And, Got it. Yeah. And then uh, some composers do, like, they'll have, um, they'll have, like, a few custom like special sense like a, a moog or something that, that they do mm. leads on or something like that but yeah for the most part it's all just like soft sense cool yeah, yeah. you don't see a studio like this too much and yeah yeah, yeah. um Production. this is more sort of personal space here yeah, yeah for exactly. your own for your yeah. own um, stuff yeah. and are you sort of composing on your own these days just for yourself yeah yeah i'm doing um my band unit 187 we're working on some new stuff which is really good Mm -hmm. And so I work on uh, some music with a friend of mine, um, like Chris Peterson, who was uh, in a band called Frontline Assembly, and um, he's got his own some of his own stuff, Ohm, which is really good. And uh, yeah, so we're working on that. And um, yeah, I'm just uh, I'm always making electronic tracks, but they I, I don't really like put them out anymore on a label or anything like that. It's mm -hmm. just mostly just for fun. Just so, for fun, yeah. 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 Cool. Speaking of bands, I know you obviously were with, uh, was it your unit oh, 187, right? Yeah. It says yeah. right on the side of the set. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's an old <laughs> when we, yeah, when we travel, when we tour and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Which is yeah. super cool. Yeah. Unit 187 was my industrial band. Um, and we, um, we did like some tours and some played a lot of festivals and had, I think we had five albums out. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But you've also played with other groups. Yeah. I played with a uh, strappy young lad who was, uh, um, this guy, a friend of mine, Devin Townsend, who he's got, he's kind of a rock, uh, guitar rock hero. So I was one of the keyboardists in his original band, and uh, we we toured like Australia and all over the place, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was, it was definitely intense. Totally, it's like it's heavy music. And then um, that, uh, I think we were playing a show in um, we were playing a show in England, and the guys from this band called Fear Factory saw us play. And so they're like, would you know, they asked me at the show, would you like to come on tour with us once this is all over? And I was like, sure thing. So I, I moved down to LA and played with them on a few tours. Nice. Um, yeah. So we did like the Oz Fest and uh, played with um, like Marilyn Manson, Pantera, you know, all these big bands. Uh, it was really crazy. Yeah. So I was instantly, I was like, playing uh, like huge stadium Dude, shows. This is like yeah. rock star stuff, man. Yeah, it was crazy. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm not. Like that was, it was like, yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. Yeah, Amazing. So it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well that's, I mean, fantastic. I mean, that's a dream for everybody. I'm sure to it, get on stage it, like that. It was fun. Yeah. Like giant stadium, 60,000 people. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I would have to like open up the show. So it'd be like the very first person to like play notes. Wow. And they would be like pretty wild. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. It was, it was, yeah. It was, it was, <laughs> it was pretty crazy. So, so. Yeah. I mean, you've had so many different experiences, yeah. Um, yeah. so many different yeah. um, things you've done. How did it all culminate now into the Johnny Morgan's Synth Dreams cha oh, yeah, uh, yeah. YouTube channel, yeah. which I'm a big fan of, I have to Thanks. say. I mean, I've yeah. seen your jams. I've also yeah. seen your documentaries. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how did this come about? What was the impetus to create the channel? Uh, what was the vision for the channel originally yeah. and, and now? And yeah. things have changed a bit um, or not? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a um, good question. So... I guess like, um, you know, COVID hit and I was like, you know, sitting in here going like, yeah, let's do something a little different. So I, I started making a couple of little like synth jams and watching channels like yours and getting inspired. Um, you know, uh, my friend Ken Marshall has his own channel that I talked about. And so I'm like, well, I could do a YouTube channel. Sure. And, um, you know, I did it for about a year and I put jams up, but you don't really get like a lot of people that interested in jam. Some of them did okay, like um, little jam sessions. It was, you know, some of my, my, you know, 303 or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think I did a couple like things where I'm like, why don't I just do like a mini documentary? Like Alex Ball kind of inspired me. He's awesome. And like guys like that, Espen Craft. I mean, he does, and those guys do such a great job. I think it's like their full time job, YouTubing. And for me, it's never really been like a job type thing. But, um, but, uh, you know, I just thought, well, I, I know a lot about since maybe I could 
give an angle that hasn't been covered before. Mm -hmm. And so some of my mini documentaries have kind of taken off a little bit, like not super great, but they're, you know, they, you know, people do watch them. And um, I try to come at it from an angle, like why, like what got like the creators of this, these instruments into making this particular thing? Like why, it's kind of the angle I come, like what was the history leading up to why it was made and like why did it end up the way it is? Right. So when like, um, when I talk about a synth, I try to like kind of put people in the time frame of when that was developed and why the circumstances came to make that what it is. And a lot of it's like industry competition, um, technology at the time you know it's tastes and styles like going from analog to digital um interface design is really neat because a lot of synths went from knobs to novelists you know mm. it was very 80s thing to do um a lot of it was cost saving but some of it was just a static they just wanted it to look that way so i think it was really it's a really fascinating time because um we lived from the like analog to digital revolution like we we were kind of around when things were like knobby and analog to like digital and software mm -hmm. and so um that transition is like super interesting actually in fact it's like it'll only ever happen once in ever right like we've we've actually lived it so which is really cool so so it's kind of for all of us it's a really great time to to kind of explore a bit. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. so when you're creating these uh, documentaries, like yeah. how do you do, is this all knowledge you already had in your head or is it, you're yeah. actually doing a lot of research, yeah. and, you know, you have to research a bit. Cause like I, I have knowledge in my head, but all, always people like have the knowledge that they have, but it's not always right. Like, mm. and so, um, trying to like, make sure I research a bit so I get the facts right. Because you don't want to make a documentary where you're like talking about something that's not true right and at the same time um you want to um you know you want to research artists like videos I, I do a lot of searching out like old videos to try to find like footage of people using a sense which is yeah. hard to find like you'd be like okay let's do a, a documentary on like the jupiter 8 well let's go back and find out who actually used it live and then you know, is there footage of them doing that and you got to find it and piece it all together so you got to make a script yeah and then record that all and edit it and then lately i've been kind of running the scripts by like some friends of mine that are kind of synth brain trust people just to make sure that things are accurate because mm -hmm. uh, i do have some friends that have some more intimate knowledge of certain things like um like you know sequential or profits like i have a friend who's like one of the profit like you know, people that just knows a lot about them. So it's, you know, if you're doing this uh, video on a profit, you want to make sure that like you're, you're asking them a lot of questions, yeah. just get it right. Get yeah. it checked out. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He, he knew a lot of things like, you know, some of my friends know like details about certain revisions of profits that like most people wouldn't know. So you just got to kind of, yeah. 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 get it once over yeah, and exactly get it yeah. cleared yeah totally. yeah for sure yeah so amazing it's kind of fun it keeps you busy like you know it's just kind of fun to do and yeah yeah i, I love those videos man yeah. they're so yeah. insightful yeah. um yeah they, they've gotten a ton of traction people yeah. love them i write all the music for them too yeah i try to i mean i try to you know get in the mood and i try to write the music for the video with the synth that i'm doing the video on right so it's a video on like a on a like a jupiter eight i would do it all on jupiter eight you know so totally. I, did a, I just did a profit video and i borrowed a friend's profit 10 and made all the songs on the on a profit 10 it, sound, it sounds it sounds mm. awesome so is, is there anything else in the future you want to do that you haven't yeah there's or is a that few. you don't have to reveal it yet no no but... i have a few uh ideas people actually message me and they're like do this synth and I kind of figure like, um, yeah, there's a list of since I've got that mm. I want to do. So yeah. Just got to get your hands on them, right? Uh, yes. Some <laughs> of them, like I'll, I'll just find friends that have them or yeah. like borrow them for a month or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. and, and for those curious, I mean, yeah. I'll post the links up in the description, but, yeah. um, where can they find your channel? It's on YouTube, obviously. Yeah. yeah Johnny Morgan synth dreams on YouTube and yeah, okay. you can find more about And that. any other like social media or, uh, instagrams not, or not really like uh actually to be honest uh, my kids want me to get on more on instagram but i i should <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but i haven't really 
Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I mean, this has been very insightful. Yeah. And uh, really thank you for your time to show us around the studio. Is there anything else you wanted to touch on while we're in here? Uh, or? No, not really. I think we kind of covered most of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, Johnny, thank you so much yeah, for yeah. your time today. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Anytime. This has been a pleasure. And uh, it's it's an amazing place. Uh, you have a lot of accomplish yeah. accomplishments, I should yeah. say. Yeah, I got to uh, just get it all uh, a little bit more uh, organized in here. But yeah, it's, it's a bit of a, you know, musicians room, really. Yeah. It's a beautiful space. Yeah. Very creative. And I'm, I'm glad to, uh, you know, be able to join you here today. Yeah. So. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, guys, uh, that will wrap up this little studio tour of Johnny Morgan's Synth Dreams Studio. So make sure you check them out online, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Yeah, see you guys. Take care.